All right, welcome to the session today. We're going to be, uh, let's just check and make sure you're in the right room. So we're going to be talking about the joy of stories. And my name is Brent Dykes. I'm a senior director of data strategy at Domo. I'm going to be presenting also with Sarah Chalupa, consulting manager, and also Asher Ten McClellan, who will be doing the demo part of our session. All right, so we're going to help you learn how to turn your data into happy little masterpieces. And how many of you know this guy? OK, Bob Ross, any fans out there? OK, good, good, good. So I have to get into character here, OK? I don't know if I can do this without the glasses, but we'll see. All right, so I don't have the same voice as Bob Ross. I can, you know, go a little lower here. <laughs> okay, so if you don't know Bob Ross, he had a, a great uh, series on PBS on teaching people how to paint. And he was, he was a great guy. And the interesting thing, and here's one of his paintings. And one of the things about Bob Ross, his show went from uh, 1983 to 1994, and there were 403 episodes, and he painted in 95% of those. Uh, there was 5% where you'd have a guest speaker come in, and th there was actually some analysis that was done by 538, <laughs> and they actually went in, did the analysis to see that at least 91% of the time he had at least one tree, one happy little tree, and multiple times he had multiple trees, at least two or more, and so I think that's an important thing about Bob Ross that we need to think about. But if we look at him as a human being, he had a, a, he had a, a positive attitude. He really liked to have a positive attitude. He, you know, he had a, a, a zest for life, and, and he shared that on his show. He made it fun and easy for people to um, learn about painting, and you know, he provided clear instructions and simple steps to help people get through and, and kind of do their first painting. And he also used simple materials, materials that people could go out and purchase at local uh, paint stores, art stores. And then lastly, you know, he believed that anything is possible. And he had that, 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 uh, that attitude that we can do anything if we just try. So we're going to try and take, we're going to try and channel some of Bob Ross into the session today as we talk about stories. And so, what we want to do is we want to help you learn how you can turn your, and I'm going to put my glasses on. I'm not as, as good as without the glasses, but we're going to help you turn your data into happy little masterpieces, okay? So as you learned in the session today, there's a new paradigm, a new platform called Stories for how you can lay out your information in a more compelling way. And there's several advantages to the stories kind of approach that we have there on, on the right side. So you have more control over the sizing and position of the, of the charts that you have or the cards on your page. So that means you reduce a lot of that wasted space in, in your dashboards that you have today, uh, which is great. You have more design options. We're going to get into a lot of those. Sarah's going to cover a lot of those in her segment. She's actually going to walk through a lot of the features there. And then you have richer interactivity, and we're going to show some of that in our demos portion. Uh, you also have more robust text options, so you can do more inline kind of commenting and, and really bringing the narrative out in your stories. And better printing and viewing and, and display options, um, e export options uh, with this new one. So we'll get into more of the details later, but this is just kind of a high level summary of what's coming. Okay, so I want to cover off some fundamentals first. So Bob Ross, he knew his audience. And when we create dashboards, we need to know our audiences. He knew that he wasn't teaching expert painters. He was teaching the, you know, a casual painter, somebody who just really wanted to li listen to his silky voice, you know, and, and relax. Um, but basically, when we look at a dashboard, we need to think foremost about the audience. That's going to really shape a lot of what goes into your design. Because then, if we know the audience, we're going to know what, what's important to them. What are their business objectives? What, are they trying, what outcomes are they trying to drive? And then we'll also have a good idea about what metrics and targets need to go into that dashboard for it to really resonate with that audience. And we'll also have a good idea as to what business questions they're trying to answer. And only then 
are we ready to really get into the visualizations and the design aspects? And so I like to think of it as that link over there. If any of those links are missing or broken, then we can't really start our visualization, right? We can't start designing things until we have a full understanding of all these things. So when we look at how we design dashboards today, if you've worked with uh, Domo Consulting or you've done it on yourselves, a lot of times we structure in collections that are based on business questions. And so that's a really good paradigm. We want to con continue that because it does influence the design of our dashboards. Uh, last year I did a presentation on data visualization and I talked about how in the media world we have you know, newspapers and articles online, different things. They'll have this inverted pyramid approach where you put the most important information in that first paragraph of the article. And then as you go deeper and deeper into the article, you get, less, you get more details, but, but it's less and less critical to you understanding uh, what's being communicated. So we can take the same approach with our dashboard design. We can say, okay, in, in that top section there, we want to provide an overview of the most critical KPIs and information. Because at the end of the day, we want to understand how are we doing? Are we winning or losing? What action do we need to take action at, at all right now? And then that next tier is, okay, what's happening? If we are winning or losing, what's contributing to that, to us winning or losing? Can we break it down by product category? Can we break it down by region? Can we break it down by different breakdowns that we've set up on our dashboard? And then lastly, we get down to the bottom, and this may not be the bottom of the page, it might actually be a separate page where we actually go into the exploration part, providing a lot more detail. So this is a good framework um, just to kind of, as a fundamental thing. Another thing is obviously, another key component of every, every story or dashboard is gonna be the charts, and you have to choose the right charts for the information you're conveying. So there's information that's, that's comparison-based, there's trend-based, there's composition-based, relationship-based, or distribution-based. All of these are components of our dashboards, right? But when we look at it from the level perspective here, at the overview level, a comparison is generally, I would find that across all of the levels. However, how we approach it at the overview level would be much different. So from a comparison side there, if we have that bar chart, it's gonna be simple. It's gonna be maybe one or two bars max. Uh, whereas at the bottom here, maybe we might have a table. You know, it's more detailed. Would I have a very complicated uh, table at the top of my page? Probably not. Because it's, again, it's gonna take time to dive into that and really, really explore it. The next thing is trending. Obviously, you know, I might have a one or two line trend at the top of, of in the overview section. But down at the bottom, I might, you know, provide more complicated um, visualization like a stacked area chart which takes a little time to kind of maybe I need to interact with it to really understand what's going on. Composition, maybe you wouldn't see that at the overview level but if you did it would be a simple binary pie chart, donut chart and then as we go down you know tree map might be something more complicated that we would have more at the explore level because there's a lot more going on there. For relationship I would probably never have a scatter plot in the overview and I would probably never have a map necessarily in the overview. Um, it's again, kind of a breakdown that takes a little bit more time to kind of analyze. Okay, so we've covered some of the fundamentals. Now we're gonna get into the design part of this. And even if we have lots of good data, it can still be overwhelming for our audiences, right? They can still be, wow, there's lots of great information here, lots of beautiful charts. Um, whoa, it's just too much. How do, I, how do I navigate through it? How do I consume that information? And so all of you in this room probably here are very, you have expertise in the data side. You know, we come from that, analytics professionals, BI professionals, we know the data side. But do we know the design side? Sometimes this can be the challenge for some of us to really, you know, how do we overcome that? You know, how do we bring the design into our, our data sets? We've collected all the right data, um, you know, we've built some, some sound um, charts, but how do we make it really resonate with people? And so we need to combine these two disciplines to really create effective dashboards and tell really effective stories. We need to combine these two disciplines. So if you think about before Domo Stories, I would kind of classify it, classify it as painting by number, where it's kind of, you know, you're kind of limited, but you're not gonna go too far astray. Um, but also, you know, maybe you don't have the full power of what you'd like to do, right? Whereas now with Domo Stories, we're giving you a blank canvas. And that is, that is super exciting. 
but it can also be super intimidating as well because just like I can create a beautiful painting, I can also mess it up. So here's kind of an, another analogy of this freedom that we have with the standard dashboards. You know, we can paint those numbers and get a decent result. And with stories now, we can go in and we can create a masterpiece or we can totally tank it <laughs> and create something hideous and disgusting. So we are here to help you understand as we transition from this world of paint by numbers to a world where you're actually going in, you have this blank canvas, we're gonna give you some guidelines, some principles to help you. So one of the key things, that if you take away nothing else from this session, visual, visual hierarchy is, one, is gonna be your friend, especially going to stories. And visual hierarchy is, is really about helping people to determine what the relative importance of something is and then what are the logic, logical groupings of the content that I'm looking at. And so in, this, in, in a situation where we have a dashboard where we really haven't designed any hierarchy into it, typically people are gonna go through and they're gonna follow what's called a Z pattern. Any Canadians in the audience, a Z pattern. <laughs> and we'll go through that and we'll consume it this way. Now I actually think that maybe, you know, there's another pattern that goes on People will attempt to start doing the Z pattern, uh, but then it kind of turns into what I call the lightning pattern, where they kind of start to consume the content and then oh, start to get overwhelmed and then kind of give up. So we want to help them. And this is where visual hierarchy will help people navigate all of the rich content that we have and really get something out of it. So I'm going to talk about um, two things that are really critical to visual perception. So we have gestalt um, theory. And we have are the principles from Gestalt, and then also pre-attentive attributes. So the first one, Gestalt principles, they came to us from German psychologists back at the turn of the century who were researching how human perception works. And they identified that we as humans group things using certain patterns or heuristics that we, we've developed um, through our DNA. And so this is really, to understand Gestalt, this really helps us with grouping. And so we have different things like proximity, right? We group by proximity, we group by similarity, we group by enclosure, we group by figure ground where something's in the foreground, something looks like it's in the background. Um, continuity, clo closure, connection, and common fate where things, if they're interactive and they're moving the same direction, we, we see those as, as part of a set. So in terms of dashboarding, I'm gonna focus on this top row here. These are all gonna be very relevant. You're gonna see examples of that in what we talk about today. Then from the pre-attentive attribute side, this is really about highlighting things, bringing things, like helping them jump out at us and show their importance, okay? And so there's color is very powerful. Um, we have position and alignment, size, intensity, orientation, shape, motion, line length, width, curvature, enclosure, added marks. If you've seen, if you've read any of the books by Stephen Few, you will be familiar with these principles. So in terms of dashboarding, I think the top four on the left are what we're gonna really focus on today. And, and they are really helpful to us as we do dashboard design. So just to show you how these principles come together and how we kind of, they can, change in terms of their dominance. In this case here, in your mind, take a moment to think, what is the dominant principle being reflected there? Probably color, right? Now, if I take those objects and I reorganize them, something interesting happens. Now, I believe in your mind, you're probably thinking, well, actually shape now is the dominant um, attribute. And then if I take those and reorganize them again, now we see, again, a different principle take over. So it's interesting to see how this can change depending on how we organize our content and it can actually affect um, how we're conveying and, and how our audiences are perceiving the groupings of the content. Okay, so now we're gonna get into specific examples and how we do this and I'm gonna focus on the grouping first, okay? So the first one here, we have a dashboard. Again, we have no particular hierarchy here and what I've done is I've gone in and I've just space things, I've pulled things together so that they look like they're in sections, right? So I've kind of organized content this way or maybe I organize it this way 
or maybe I organize it this way. Just by moving things around and grouping them close together, I've now helped the audience to see, oh, I guess these are close together, uh, these are a group. Now, here's the key thing to remember. With all of these principles I talk about today, we can do this intentionally or we can do this unintentionally. And what I mean by unintentionally, oh, those aren't really, you're not supposed to be perceiving these as together, but we have to be conscious of how people are gonna interpret them. If they're close together, if there's proximity, they're gonna assume that there's, they're a set, they go together, they're related. And this next one, alignment adds order. And so with the new stories tool, you'll find that you cannot break the alignment from a horizontal perspective. But you can get into trouble with the vertical alignment. And so you have control over how how, how to stretch the, the different cards out longer, make them wider or short or not as wide. And so in this case here, you'll notice on the left there, I have um, that line chart in the middle that's kind of three quarters of the, the page width there. Now, if, my, if there was a relationship on this page between this column bar chart here and the line chart, you know what, I probably wanna size it so that they're the same alignment. So again, if I have somebody coming in looking at that, they're gonna say, oh, okay, these are related. Whereas on the left there, it's, it's not as obvious. Another example here, maybe with the scatter plot, it is actually related to this donut chart and the map below. And so if I, again, align them, rather than having them spaced out three across the page like that, I actually take them and align them underneath. I'm again, just helping reinforce the association between them. So similarity conveys relationships as well. You notice that I have some KPI gauge, gauges across the top there, but they're different, right? There's, there's two different styles of gauges there. And if I really wanted to show that those metrics are similar and that they're kind of a set that go together, I can take them and I can use the same chart type to kind of convey that information that they're a set. If I did want to do the opposite and I wanted to convey that actually, no, they are not a set, they are different, then maybe I would stick with what I have on the left. Also, color is very powerful, right? I can, I can use color in these cases here to convey, hey, this blue section here is all related to our marketing, and the green section there is all related to our sales data. Okay, so now we'll get into the importance side. So from an importance perspective, the most important information in the Western culture is gonna be in your top left, right? And so as we move from left to right, it's gonna get less and less important, or as we move down the page, it's gonna get less and less important. And so what we wanna make sure is that, you know, again, going back to that inverted pyramid, we have our most important information at the top of the page. So in this case, on the left, you'll see I've got some ga KPI gauges and different things. I've got the scatter plot at the top, and I've reorganized it so that my most important KPIs and information is at the top of the page. That's what I want the executives to see first. Then they can start exploring some of the other uh, breakdowns and different things on the page. Now, a question is with the, the filters, right? You, you, you're now gonna have interactive filters. Do we put those inter interactive filters on the left-hand side? Do we put them across the top? Or do we put them down the right-hand side? And this will depend on your users. Again, going back to the audience being the most important thing, so think of your audience. If it's an audience you anticipate that are gonna use the dashboard infrequently, then maybe you need to put that filter on the left so that they remember it's there because they're not using the dashboard on a regular basis. However, for other users where you, let, you know, oh, they're gonna be using the, this dashboard a lot, and that, that filter, it doesn't need to be front and center. We could actually push it over to the right-hand side because they're gonna know it's there and the content is, is now the focus. Another thing is size matters. Obviously, the bigger something is, the more attention it's gonna draw. And so in this case here, I may do that intentionally where I take that, that bullet chart and say, you know what, this is important we hit our targets this year. I'm gonna make that bullet chart really big because I want people to really zero in on it and remember that we're trying to hit these key targets this year. However, sometimes we just make things big so that people can use them, right? So they can see the details. And so that's okay. You'll notice though, in position wise, this is not in the top left corner of this page, it's actually at the bottom. So we're, we're using different principles to kind of offset each other. So color is also another powerful signal. In this case here, we're using the traffic lights, bad, caution, good. Um, it could have been, you know, hot and cold. 
We can use different principles. Obviously, with red and green, you have to be careful with colorblind. Um, so sometimes maybe looking at other ways, but, but definitely it can resonate with people. Um, sometimes we may want to focus people's attention on a particular category of data or a particular value within the data. And in this case here, what I've done is I brought that data point to the foreground, you know, using color and pushed everything else as context to the background using grayscale. And so that may be a powerful way to, again, to communicate to your audience what you want them to focus on, what's important. Contrast is very important. You saw in the main stage demo that they had the dark background. And so you can enable a dark background on your individual cards, but the thing that we have to be careful about in this case is we want to have contrast, right? We want to have dark, a light on a dark background or, or a dark um, on, a, on a light background or light on a dark. So we want to make sure there's ample co contrast there. And the other thing you can do, obviously you have text, and text can be very powerful in terms of uh, signposts and, and, and guideposts to help people consume the content. And then also icons and pictures can be helpful. In this case here, maybe I, I have data here for a car enthusiast segment and maybe our gamer segment. And so I'm using those icons to kind of help people navigate the content and find information and maybe even prioritize it in their mind what's most important to them. So even though we have, I've talked about a lot of tips and, and best practices for visual hierarchy, we can still have a lot of great data and it can be overwhelming. And so one of the things you have to also think about is how much is too much, right? So typically you have to think of it kind of like in, in, in a media article, there's gonna be content that's below the fold. And we would typically recommend that your page, your total page length shouldn't be more than one and a half or two times the length of, uh, in terms of screens. Um, no section should be larger than the visible screen. Obviously you run into challenges when it's longer than the visible screen. And you may also consider linking to other pages that maybe have more details. So you're not overwhelming people with too much information. So I'll leave you with one quote, last quote before I turn it over to Sarah. And I like this from Stephen Krug, who talked to, he's a UX expert and he said, if something requires a large investment of time or looks like it will, it's less likely to be used. So even though you may build a very, da a very beautiful dashboard, um, but if it comes across as overwhelming, then there's a good chance people won't use it and adopt it. And then all the value and all the work that we went into creating that dashboard is lost. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah and she's gonna teach you, uh, show you some actual examples within the product. Cool. All right, thanks Bob. All right, so if you're anything like me, um, I, I work in consulting. When Brent showed me these uh, principles, I was like, obviously, based on your wig and you know your nice PowerPoints, um, you live in a fantasy land. I actually have to implement this, so how am I supposed to do that? So that's why I'm here today. So um, how do you get started? The first thing that you should know is that you follow the same process. We are still going to drive to this visualization and design from audience and their business questions. Think about stories as simply icing on the cake. It just helps you design a little bit better. So you should still drive from that audience. Now I've broken it down into a three-step process. First, you're going to sketch your painting and, and make a plan for how you're going to use your canvas and what, you, what you're going to paint. Then, within painting, you're going to use tools and techniques to um, actually execute it. And then finally, we're going to display it. And you'll want to think about how your users are going to consume it and how you might distribute your painting. So first, let's start with sketching. Now, I like three-step processes, apparently, because this is also three steps. <laughs> um, first, you're going to convert your page to a story. Next, you'll change the layout template that best suits your needs. And finally, you're going to arrange the cards for that really custom feel. So let's start by looking at converting your page to a story. Here I have a traditional dashboard and a collection, and my collection is full of cards that answer my business question. In the top right corner, I'm going to click Design Dashboard, and 
it's going to bring me the, to this splash screen where it asks me if I want to, if I'm sure I want to make this conversion. Um, don't worry too much here because you can always go back to a standard page. The only thing that you risk losing is the card sizing that was on the original page. So as long, I mean, that doesn't, it's a few clicks. So um, don't be, you know, don't be scared. So click design dashboard, and this brings us to our editing dashboard. Think of this as your canvas. Um, so now that brings us to step two, changing the layout. You can see in the middle that um, Domo took its best shot at guessing a layout template that was going to work for the number of cards that I had. And it's similar to kind of how, what it does in Card Analyzer. So we think of this as a, this is a group of cards, it's called the layout. And in the top left corner of that group of cards, there are three options. The top one allows you to drag and drop that group of cards among the others. The middle one allows you to change the template to a different uh, layout template. And then you can remove the entire, um, <laughs> and then you can remove the entire, delete all of that group of cards. Clicked a little early, but when you click change layout, this is the menu that you'll see. And um, so you can sort by a number of different ways to find a layout template that works for you. It's either by number of cards or categories. So number of cards is pretty self-explanatory, but I'll take a moment to explain each of the categories. First, we have hero templates. These are templates that use size and position to create a hero card and, and show importance of that metric. Next are quick summary cards. And um, this is a series of small cards that are intended to be glanced at. And so design principles here that are pretty important are similarity, um, yeah, creating similarity across them. So you can do that by having the same chart type or potentially um, changing the card background color so that way they all uh, are, are similar in that way. Then we have with banner templates. And here you can add a header or text on how you use it, similar to say like a, a collection description. And finally, there are general purpose templates. And um, one thing to note about general purpose templates is that uh, you want to be careful about making sure that you use design elements appropriately here. Um, so that way you can guide your user through how to use these, um, these templates. Now, with so many templates to choose from, I mean, we have a ton of templates to choose from. Don't get too hung up on getting the right one. Treat step two in, in these templates as getting you 90% of the way there. Um, it's, in fact, this step's actually probably optional because the layouts, Stories is intended to be able to drag and drop everything to get a custom size. So that brings me to step three, arranging your cards. And this is where you get that really custom feel. So here, I'm going to drag this card, grab it, and I want to put it next to this other one. So I, I'm going to make that move. And then I realize that I actually want those top three to just be consistent and take up the whole thing. So I'm going to move those over, remove that, move those over. So now I have this, but the bottom card, I don't actually think I need that anymore. I want to replace it. And as I'm replacing it, I realized that I actually want more space for the card I'm going to pull in. So I'm going to move all of these cards up. And with a few enthusiastic drags and clicks, I find myself with a bit of a mess on my hands that's pretty hard to interpret and read. But have no fear. You can always click that change layout icon and go back to a set template um, and restart. So treat it as a reset button. So now that we have um, a template that works for you and you've sized everything out, we really have the sketching of your canvas done. And, um, and we know exactly how we're going to use it. So let's jump into the next phase, painting. Like I said, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to introduce new tools that Stories enables, as well as techniques. So first, the tools. Um, the editing dashboard is your canvas. On the right-hand side, we have your palette where you can pull in various um, features. So here, we can pull in a header, a new layout template, grouping of cards, an individual card, any image file, a text box, or a horizontal border. Also in the top right, we have page options. Right now, 
you can only select between white and gray, although as you heard this morning, soon it will be any color or image. But even with only the two options, you can still use these pretty strategically, which I'll, I'll get into a little bit later. And finally, within each card slot, we have a number of options. So you can choose a different, you can choose a different card for that slot. You can, within display settings, you can select a new, you can type, sorry, toggle on whether you want the title, the time frame, or the summary to show. You can change the interaction, so what do, exactly what do you want to have happen when you click on that card, which again, I'll go into later. You can change the background color for that card. You can move it to the appendix or remove it from the dashboard altogether. Now, one, one thing to note about the appendix versus dashboard or removing it altogether. The appendix is at the bottom of the page. And so, um, you know, if you think that you might use it again, you're probably gonna wanna put it there rather than removing it from the dashboard altogether because that just sends it off into the domo sphere. Um, but when you move it to the appendix, when you search for a new card, all of the uh, cards in the, in the appendix will show up at the top of your search results. So um, just keep that in mind when you're uh, moving things out on and off of your canvas. So those are all your new tools. Now let's talk about some techniques and how we can apply the principles that Brent shared into stories. So creating collections. Collections is something we've all heard. It's somewhat of an artifact of traditional dashboards, but it has good design principles of grouping things that are similar and answering a business question. So here I simply pulled in a header, a text box, and I changed the background on that text box, and I added a border at the bottom to create a collection for my user to understand how to use those cards. Um, one thing I wanna note, though, is that with collections and stories, they don't function like your traditional collections. Um, collections and traditional dashboards can collapse and, and, you know, and, and reopen, and so if real estate is important to your user and if they want that functionality, you might consider sticking with tra a traditional dashboard rather than creating them in stories. All right, let's talk about how to use color now strategically. Here at the top, I have a design studio app. And in that app, the blue represents costs, purple is impressions, and green is view views. So when I created the next table for goal details, I used beast modes and HTML coding to pull in those same colors um, so that I can create similarity between the metrics and, and mix an easy story for my user. And then at the bottom, I use color rules to apply this same, um, this same color scheme. Now, another way that I could have done this with a new feature that Stories enables is with chart background colors. Um, you can get a little wild with this, though, so be careful. But with, when I'm only working with three, it works. And as a reminder, that comes from this edit content dropdown. Let's talk about another way to use color in text for navigation. So here on this collection, I have two text boxes and I've changed the colors on them. One tells us how to use that collection of cards and the other tells me what potential actions I can take. So when I use this in a series of, uh, of collections on a page, my, I can train my user to create a system of, okay, I always know that I can go here to, on how to use this and what these cards mean and I can always go here to understand what actions I can take off of it. And something else I want to talk about here is uh, how easy the new t inline text uh, boxes are. Before, when we had traditional notebook cards, if you wanted to put any kind of annotation or anything outside of um, you know, what we could fit in Buzz, and if you wanted it to sh show up on the screen, we had to put that into a full-size card um, or a large card, and it was kind of a clunky user experience because it wasn't fitting in, you know, next to, right next to the cards that we were interested in. Um, but now with custom sizing, it can fit really anywhere on the page uh, that makes sense based on the cards that I have. Also, you don't have to click edit anymore and go into the card details in order to edit the text. So right here in my editing screen, I was able to just click on the card and type exactly what I want, bold what the titles on it, and it's a really easy process. So it enables a lot more, um, a lot more capabilities. Now here's another way that I used color and text for storytelling. 
Brent shared some ways to storytell, and you know he was highlighting metrics. Um, but I think as demo users, we know that that can be a little bit difficult. But here's a way that I use storytelling to tell a story with only a few clicks. So first, I pulled in a uh, I changed the sorry. I pulled in a text uh, box and I changed the background color of it to red to say, "Danger! We are not going to meet our sales goal." And that way, I can send it to my executive. And um, I also am citing that the daily ROI and an underperforming campaign are to blame for us not going to hit our goal. So I've highlighted all of those um, all of those particular cards of interest in gray, so that way my executive's eye is drawn to that immediately. So shifting gears here, let's talk about those display settings and when you should toggle on and off certain features. In this, in this example, I have chosen to include certain summary numbers, but not others. On the goal pacing, I chose not to include it because in the middle of that radial dial, I have the, the total number of sales. And also in the spend pacing, I did not include our total spend because that's already noted at the top. So in order to be thoughtful and not repetitive for my user, I've, I've de decided what to include and what not to. Now here's an example of hiding titles. You can see that on the bottom row, I didn't include any titles there. But due to the, using the principle of alignment, I've created three different groupings of cards um, that are all you know, one for each metric. All right, now I promised I would talk about page backgrounds and how you can use them strategically. On this page, I purposely chose to use white because I liked what it did for my, my alignment. Um, but if I were to change it to gray, I can create borders. So you can use borders, you can use gray versus white to create borders and think strategically about when, when that would be beneficial versus having more white space. Finally, you should incorporate images now that we have the ability. So here I've included branding for this healthcare company. And um, you know, it's nice variety, it's visually appealing, and it makes our story on brand. So I really like that. Although when I showed this, it was a final deck and I showed it to Brent and he was like, okay, we just went over above the fold. You're really wasting a lot of, of real estate there. So don't make that mistake. Be, be careful where you put your, uh, your images. Another way that we can use images, though, is, um, for example, here, when we're measuring a campaign effectiveness. So um, I've included a creative for this Greek getaway that we're measuring in this campaign dashboard. And one of the things that I'll go into next is interaction filters. Um, with an interaction filter, I've defined that I want to link to an external page, say maybe a content repository, or maybe this campaign's uh, website. Um, so I, it gives my user a lot richer experience and um, it's more robust in where I go next. So that brings me to the final section of display. First, let's talk about the interactivity strategy. Think about your interactivity strategy in terms of an art museum. You can either do a self-guided, self-paced exploration tour where um, you get to, to view things on your own, but you might need to know a little bit more about the art ahead of time. Um, or you can do a guided tour where you just have to show up and they'll bring you to all of the relevant uh, things, in the, things in the museum. So in terms of Domo, a self-guided tour might look something like these, uh, the page filters that we've always traditionally had. It, the user selects page filters and then a data set and the field and the value that they want to choose. So the, it gives the user maximum flexibility, they drive their experience, but it does require them to have a certain amount of data literacy so that they know how, what to do with, with these cards. On the other hand, a guided tour in Domo at the most basic level looks like quick filters on a card. So with quick filters, we're essentially suggesting to our users um, hey, you might want to filter on this field or these values. That, that's that's a generally a way that we would do this. At the page level, that would be maybe a page slicer card, making that same suggestion of how they might filter their content. And now with stories, this interactive, our interaction filters give us that ultimate tour guide experience. 
So when we open this, this menu pops up. And here I can define whether I want a click on that card to go to details, just like it typically has, if I want it to filter content on other cards on the page and what other cards I want it to filter on, um, so selective filtering, um, or if I want to link to any other page in Domo, think like a details page around a campaign, or an external web page, like I said earlier, a content repository, a YouTube video, or something like that. So we can we have ultimate flexibility now in, in terms of how we create that tour guide. So give it some thought. Do you want to create an exploratory, um, you know, user user guided experience, or do you want to have a curated interactive experience for your user? Um, but it's going to require you to have some thoughtful design from the very beginning. And lastly, let's talk about distribution. So um, just like anything in Domo, we want you to be able to distribute layouts and stories in any manner. Um, there are a few things that I want to point out, though. These are printable in PDF, um, and every layout template is designed so that it, the layout template fits one template per page. So if printing is important to your organization, sticking to those templates is a great way to ensure that you're going to have a, a useful printout. And even when you're dragging, it will give you warnings that you're getting above a page. On mobile, all of this renders on mobile, um, and your interaction filters are honored on the mobile app as well. And finally, my favorite new distribution uh, feature is with scheduled reports, you get the full design in your email rather than one card at a time. So this, <laughs> yes, good, good. Well, it's his favorite too. Um, <laughs> I'm glad I'm not alone. I've been asking for years. Thanks. Yes, great. Yeah, so this provides you the opportunity to be even more thoughtful in your design um, when you're using scheduled reports. So that concludes the end of my section. I hope that you're feeling a little bit more confidence. I was able to, um, you know, channel my inner Bob Ross and make the joy of make joy stories a little less intimidating. And I'll leave you with a final quote that Bob Ross said, all you need is to paint is a few tools, a little instruction, and a vision in your mind. And I hope that I've given you some of that today. So now I'm going to pass it over to Asher to put some of this into a live demo. OK. So we've covered a little bit of theory uh, with Brent's section, and Sarah's done a really thorough walkthrough of pretty much anything you can do with the new Domo Stories uh, features. Uh, so my job is to show you an actual dashboard and walk you through uh, the design elements that we've chosen for this particular dashboard. So uh, this is a retail operations dashboard for the biggest company you've never heard of, Motomart. Uh, and um, we're going to dive in and, and take a look at some of the elements here. So you can see right away we have used images and colors to group uh, the areas of content that we have. So this orange uh, at the top, this image, is really well aligned with all the sales numbers we have below. Uh, and we're using color here to bring and call out the narrative. So, you know, Brent talking about what, how we read from most important on the left-hand side. You can see, obviously, that's our total sales, but the narrative is really, really important. And Sarah talked about the difficulties of using note cards for using narrative in the past. Uh, the way that we have the, the text boxes here now are phenomenal. Uh, you're able to include uh, actual summary numbers uh, in your text that update as your data updates. And so it's a really great feature to include uh, and have real-time narrative on what's happening on your page. Uh, and uh, another item here as well that we, if we scroll down, you can look, okay, we have colors organized around the category performance with this green, uh, as well as this icon here. You can see we've, we have different colors for each of the cate categories here, so apparel and blue, grocery and orange, and that aligns with the cards down below. 
And so um, not quite as, as sexy as the, uh, the bike, for those of you that saw the demo uh, earlier today, but something that someone like me can put together uh, without any kind of code uh, or experience uh, customizing these SVGs that you see. So the really cool thing about these, these icons that you see is it allows us to filter the page uh, using those icons. So I have a little heat map here, uh, or SVG, rather, that I'm able to select, and it will filter everything on this page uh, to those regions that I've selected. And so the really nice thing is that, you know, not only can I choose the interactions on the page itself, but I can also select which cards I've opted out of that interaction. So you can see down here we have a benchmark, uh, a benchmark card comparing each of the regions. It wouldn't really make sense to, to filter that benchmark card to one specific or two specific regions because you lose the broader context of this benchmark card. So I've opted out of interactions for this particular card uh, based on this filter here. But everything else on the page uh, is, is derived or uh, interacts with this little SVG down here. Similarly, uh, with these categories here, uh, same thing. If I click on any of these icons, you can see that it's going to filter the rest of the page uh, to the apparel. And again, with this benchmark card over here, I wanted to leave that alone because you, know, you don't want it interacting or filtering specifically to the apparel category because you want to see how each of those categories are performing against each of your regions. So let's look at this through a lens of I'm the North America retail manager for all my stores in Motomart. And I want to see what's going on. So I'm actually going to go ahead and remove some of these filters that I have just set up so we can see on the whole what that actually looks like. And so overall we're doing pretty well. You know, we're seeing an uptick in our sales year over year. Our, our baskets guys is a little down uh, and the transactions are up so we have a great you know, organization around these secondary summary cards or summary numbers. And for those of you that haven't played with the Sparkline cards yet, they are fantastic. They're my favorite new cards. Essentially, you are able to create these, uh, these change, year-over-year -year changes, uh, comparing the first and last value of the card without actually having to write any beast modes. So super powerful card. Uh, highly recommend checking it out. Uh, but you can see here, overall, we're doing pretty well. But this benchmark card, something weird's going on. You know, pretty much all my regions have you know 4% or higher you know 6.7 7.4 in the north or in the west uh, but southeast is lagging we've seen seen positive growth and if we were just looking at the southeast think okay that's not bad but clearly they are lagging behind the other regions so what's going on so i'm going to go ahead and i'm going to select that region and we're going to dive in to what's happening in the southeast so filtering down to the southeast and looking at all across all the categories, you can see that while our basket size has dropped, again, our transactions are up. So something, something's going on in the store. Why, are, not, why can not, are people not able to find all the products that they want to purchase? Uh, you know, the transactions are up, so more people are actually in the stores buying things, but they're not buying as much stuff. So my first step, or my first logical place to go, is I want to see what's happening in stores. And for a lot of our retails, MPS is really, really important. Uh, how our associates are performing in the store? Uh, are people able to find what they need? Do we have things in stock? Uh, all those elements are really, really important to understanding uh, this basket size figure here and why we're seeing a drop. So coming over to this page, you can see that it's in the old, uh, the old dashboard kind of paradigm. Uh, still very, very useful. Our content is organized really well. Uh, and we have uh, MPS here. And um, you know, we have some of the metrics around uh, associate availability and stock availability. But I want to dive in to the regions that I was seeing uh, issues in. So I'm just going to look at a couple of areas um, in um, in the southeast to see what's, what's actually happening uh, in that area. So if I look at the district, it gives me a breakdown of the different um, districts within the southeast region. And I'm, again, I'm using the old kind of page filters to do that. It's taking a minute here to load.
you know how live demos go. So. Okay, so I know that I want to look at what's happening in some of these districts in the southeast. So I'm going to select Central Florida, and I'm going to look at Mississippi as well. And looking here, you can see, yeah, something is going on. Our customers are not as happy going through this store. And kind of surfing through the content here, okay, looks like they're relatively happy with how our associates are performing but we have an in-stock issue. We're far below the benchmark, as well as their checkout times and the overall front-end experience are not great. So these are things that we need to improve, uh, particularly in these two areas, to address our basket skies issue. So uh, I want to create a real quick page to send over to the, the regional manager in the southeast so she can go take a look at what's happening uh, in the region. So I've copied over all the cards uh, that are important to me uh, both from the, the first page that we looked at, the retail page with the sales numbers, as well as the MPS page that we were just looking at. And I've already set the, the filters to look at specifically the two areas or the two districts that I think need to be addressed. So let's create a quick dashboard uh, in Domo Stories. Clicking on the icon in the top right, I can see, okay, time to design my dashboard. It does a pretty decent job of putting things in the places that uh, I would put them. So in stock availability, clearly that's the number one thing we want to address. That's in the top left. But I'm not totally happy with how they have laid things out for us automatically. So I'm just going to make some changes here and I want to show how easy it is to drag and drop to adjust these cards into an experience that I'd want to send over to Sarah and she can consume and hopefully fix what's going on in the southeast region. So I'm going to grab some of these. Um, and again, MPS is the most important item, as well as the in-stock availability. I'm going to adjust some of these card sizes. And then these sales figures I want to group together as well. OK, that's still not great. So I'm going to go ahead and group these items next to each other. And maybe I'll drop this underneath. OK, still not great. OK, this is looking a little better. And I'm going to drop the MPS at the bottom. Great. OK. So we have our in-stock availability at the top. We have basket size and total sales down here at the bottom. And we're going to just readjust these. So our most important content is reading left to right. Uh, and we have MPS down here at the bottom. Still relatively important. But again, if we address these issues at the top, then MPS will correct itself. And then basket size, again, is probably the next most important item. So I'm going to make a couple other adjustments in terms of sizing. OK, great. Now, let's look at the specific stores in the region. So what I also want to highlight is the ability to add the card slicers to filter by store. And so we're going to create a brand new filter here at the top by clicking uh, the Add Card. And we're going to add a content. And we're going to create a brand new card. So it's going to ask me if I want to save my dashboard. I'm going to say yes. And then I'm going to select the data set that I'm interested in creating like the store view. So in this case, it's our sales data. And it brings it us into the analyzer that we're all familiar with. So down here on the right, you can see we have a filters category. And so I'm going to select the filters. And let's select radio button. I think that's going to be most appropriate. And we're going to drag in the store locations. So at first look, these are a lot of numbers. It's a little bit overwhelming. But if you remember, we are filtering just to two specific areas. So I'm going to save this card, and I'm going to come out. And you'll see, hopefully here in a minute, that the card 
is now filtered to the specific store locations in the two districts that I'm interested in, in correcting. So I come here, I filter to a particular store, it adjusts everything on the page to look at what's happening in store 130. So the regional manager can go to that specific store manager and say, hey, I need you to correct these numbers. Those store managers can come to this dashboard, see what's going on in their stores. And so it's a really great way to use the card slicer features as well. So uh, that is it in terms of what I wanted to show uh, in terms of the actual full-fledged uh, experience with using images as well as the narrative and some of the SVGs. But I also wanted to show it's, it's pretty easy to put it together a story very, very quickly. It took me a few minutes and this is something that the regional manager is going to be able to consume. And so my last step here is to share this with the regional manager, which in this case is Sarah. She has two jobs. And uh, we're just going to say, fix this or you're fired. <laughs> OK. So uh, I hope you guys uh, got a lot out of our presentation today. Uh, Sarah did a great job of covering all the features that are available uh, and how to use those features with some of the theory uh, that Brent outlined, and um, hopefully here you have some ideas on the pages that you might be able to curate and cultivate in your organization. So I want to invite Sarah and Brent up, uh, and we'd op like to open the floor to answer any questions. Do we have a mic runner? Do you want to start since you're in the front? <laughs> So um, I won't show that, but it's basically a beast mode. So if you're familiar with beast mode, it's the same thing. So we use the beast mode engine in order to create uh, the summary number, the dynamic summary numbers, and then you select that beast mode to apply to that area. Yeah, that's right. So like any other card, that's how you would, that's how you would use that. Okay. Over here. <laughs> there we go. Once you create a layout, that you really like and most likely will duplicate. Can you save that as a template? Oh, that's a great suggestion. <laughs> I, not currently. Those are product manager. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Josh had to leave. Yeah. <laughs> we'll bring that back to the product manager. <laughs> that's great. Can you only use summary numbers when you're in that narrative text box to show? You were talking about that you show beast mode summary numbers. Can you only use summary numbers or other variables from? From like other cards? Yeah. Yeah, today it's just like the summary numbers or the beast modes. Yeah. Okay, you had a question back there? Staying on the narrative uh, analysis portion, um, does the text change dynamically too? Because you've got like increased, slightly increased, or increased. Yeah. I mean, if the numbers switch, I mean, do I have to go back in manually and change that? Yeah. Yeah, so today, no, but they, they are working on that. I do know. Um, I just don't know the timing on when they're going to have like conditional text, essentially. And so that is something that is high priority, for sure. Back there. <laughs> the category filters, um, I noticed that you guys you, you do that. How do you, like the, the actual one with like the apparel categories and... Yes, yeah, so you have yeah. those nice little icons that you, know, you could click on and that would uh, filter the uh, data sum. Yeah, so it's really easy. Uh, Brent actually created the icons and what would you use? Just an illustrator. Yeah. So I, I built it in Illustrator, created an SVG file and then basically uh, give it to the technical guys to hook up. Yeah, but it's really not that difficult. Basically, you know, with the SVG, you can then just say, I want this piece of data or this column to align with, um, with the SVG that I upload. So the actual configuration, which will have instructions in the Help Center on how to configure those, it's really, really straightforward. I'm not that technical, and I was able to uh, configure it. Okay, so. so there's a place online I can go. Yeah, uh, yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We're about a minute over time, so we'll take these last two. Um, is there a way to save as or copy um, a story that you've created? And then um, I guess if you wanted to save as or copy or whatever you want to do and then change 
what your data input is. So you can use it for like, let's say in our case, we're a media agency. I could use another client's data in the same template. Is that possible? Sure. Yep, so you can save as, you can save the page as a new page, um, and then it will create everything as duplicates. It'll set up another page with those duplicate cards, and then you would just go into each of those car individual cards and change the data set over. Yep, and then last one. Um, and so on that linking feature that you showed where you can jump to another page, can you have it apply the filters from the card that you clicked on so that it, pr it filters based on what the user clicked on? Hmm. So um, there's kind of two aspects, not exactly how you described it, but there is a way to set up the link um, for when the user clicks on it, it will set a series of filters, but we don't have the ability yet to say like, dynamically say this user select these three filters on this page and then have that carry over to the next page. But that is a very important ask that I, I know uh, the product team's working on because that's been surfaced by quite a few of our beta customers. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. Thank Great. you very much. Thank you. Thank you.